Good morning, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of Ranking the Albums today in the co-captain's chair. Once again, Mr. Martin Popoff. Absolutely. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. We're, we're uh, very eager this morning to talk about Blackfoot. Uh, Martin and I talk about Southern rock bands all the time, and Blackfoot has always been one of my favorites. And uh, long career, very interesting career. A lot of really good albums, some not so good, uh, which I'm sure we're going to get into here. Uh, fronted most of the time, not anymore, by Ricky Medlock, who, of course, has been in Leonard Skinner now for a number of years. But uh, early on, Blackfoot, probably one of the heaviest of the Southern rock bands and uh, a band that kind of teetered over the edge into like really, really heavy hard rock and metal, I think, for a while. Right. I mean, it's a listen to those couple albums. It's like, man, these guys were uh, and they toured with all the metal bands of the day. Right. I mean interesting trajectory of these guys over the years yeah definitely they they were they were the one that crossed over and they were certainly the heaviest of the uh, of the southern rock bands which is probably why we like them so much so. yeah exactly <laughs> so we got 11 studio albums we're going to tackle here today and uh, we're going to go from our least favorite to our favorite i'll have martin kick us off with his number 11. okay so my number 11 is uh is the Rick Medlock and Blackfoot album. So I, I did not go with the boy band album. That's coming up at some point. So here we go. This Rick Medlock and Blackfoot album. This is the first one where basically the band is all uh, imploded, exploded. Um, it's he's got three guys with them that have nothing to do with the history of Blackfoot, and it's 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 a very um, commercial. There's even like some finger popping bass on it. And, and it's kind of a bad production. Sounds nothing like Blackfoot, except for the album before it, which I really don't like either, Vertical Smile. So it, it is a carry forward from that one. But you look at that front cover and it looks like it should be a regular Blackfoot album. But obviously the first warning is that the name of the band is, what is the name of the band? Is it Rick Medlock? Is it Rick Medlock and Blackfoot? What's the name of the album? It's I, I hate when bands do that, right? Um, but yeah, it's essentially a Rick Medlock solo album. It's very commercial. He's just trying to have a, a radio hit. It's it's one of the worst examples of the many examples when these Southern rock bands try to go all a, a, AOR. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And I'm going to talk a little later about one time where I really think it worked. I, I thought it was really good. Um, but uh, but no, this album is is very, very unlistenable. Um, so yeah, I put it at the, at the bottom of my list. 1987, yeah. Sounds like Chicago, Peter Cetera, all that sort of stuff, right? Midwest rock, um, but the worst kind of mid Midwest rock. So yeah, just just not a good album. And it's amazing how many of these Southern rock ba bands fell into that trap come 85, 86, and 87. So many of them. And it's almost like you could interchange, you know, swap any of those albums and you, you almost can't even tell who the band is, right? They all kind of sound the same. They're all pretty forgettable. Uh, my number 11, I'm going to go with the 84 album, Vertical Smiles. I mean, for me, this is just a pretty dreadful album. This is the last album with Ken Hensley on uh, keyboards. Ken Hensley, of course, the legendary member of Uriah Heep, who weirdly joined this band uh, a couple of years prior. Uh, Charlie Hargret, the other lead, co-lead guitar player, is not on this album either. It's just, to me, this is kind of like their, their kind of pop metal album. Way too many covers barely a lick of southern rock anywhere on here you got those really bad electronic drum sounds which you know permeate so many albums and that during that time period uh they even cover a peter Cetera song on here you know you mentioned chicago before living in the limelight might even be the best song on this album this set as that is and that's probably the heaviest thing that peter Cetera ever did uh i don't know to me this is just a completely forgettable album terrible cover art um, yeah, this was a big, big, big misfire, in my opinion, you know, considering all those great albums that came before it. So uh, that's the bottom of the barrel for me. Yeah. All right. Very cool. So uh, my number 10 is Southern Native, which is uh, this notorious, notorious situation. I remember interviewing Ricky for this great album cover, um, but it's a boy band. It's basically Ricky getting a bunch of these guys that look like Joe Strummer on the back uh you know or, or taxi driver or whatever right you know with a mohawk uh you know don't look like a southern rock band a bunch of young guys um the recording isn't very good it's pretty heavy um there's there's a few southern rock tro rock tropes on it but you know if, if all through that time like i love interviewing ricky and I, I i love the guy right but but it seems like there's definitely some skeletons in the closet and there was a lot of drama between him and the other guys 
you know, would they fought over the name? Obviously, the one I already, you know, mentioned is him with a bunch of strangers calling himself Blackfoot. And now he's gone so far, it almost seems like he's doing this just to upset them even more. Uh, and basically hires a boy band to be Blackfoot. I mean, I, I don't know if that's ever happened in the history of bands. I know, I know there are boy band versions of bands that that it has a has a tradition all the way back to the '60s, but it's usually some greedy manager putting the thing together. I don't, I don't know of another case where where like a guy who was in a band is now the uh, the puppeteer, the master of puppets of the boy band. It's it's just a whole bizarre situation. Yeah, um, yeah, it's very strange. You would think, you know, maybe all right, I'm, I'm going to put together a new band with me as the leader, right? Which he always kind of has been anyway. And it's, I mean, his Leonard Skinner days are winding down, right? So, but then he just like says, okay, I'm going to give my stamp of approval to have a band called Blackfoot with all new guys. I'm going to produce it. I'm going to write the songs. I may throw in a guitar solo or two, uh, but they'll they'll be Blackfoot, and I'm just going to go do something else. I, it's unheard of right i it's very strange very strange yeah. uh, we'll get to that again in a minute i'm, I'm gonna go uh ricky medlock or sorry rick medlock there's no ricky here rick medlock yeah. and blackfoot for my number 10 uh yeah i mean you hit the nail on the head it's kind of basically it's a it's a medlock solo album um again more of that kind of 80s like overproduced poppy metal kind of like the vertical smiles album not much southern rock happening here at all way too many synthesizers i mean they're all over the place on here you know, Saturday night, rock and roll tonight, kind of rocking. The rest of it, pretty pretty forgettable and just not a very enjoyable album. I remember when this thing came out, I was kind of like, what in the world is, is he thinking here? Um, and all these years later, I'm still saying the same thing. Yeah. Back to you. <laughs> Wicked, yeah. Okay, so my number nine is Vertical Smiles from 1984, which Pete, you eloquently talked about. Um, you know, this is basically produced by Eddie Offord, which is really bizarre because it's it's dreadful production, just these horrible drum sounds and stuff. And I remember I interviewed Jackson about this record, um, you know, and, and he just he hated it, too. And Jackson left us what I, I think it was 2005. I made a note on that. Uh, but um, yeah, Jackson um, at the age of 53, Jackson Spires, you know, the, the drummer of the band or the heart of the band, he wrote the early material, right? Um, died of an aneurysm, uh, age of 53, but, um, but I did get to get the pleasure of interviewing him. And he, I, I guess this record had originally been called Cry the Banshee or something like that. And, and there was very heavier, there was a much heavier version of it early on, but then it just got turned into this, this horrible, you know, clattery drums, stiff production. I mean, it doesn't even, there's no personality of Jackson in it. Um, they cover Morning Dew. I never want to hear anybody cover Morning Dew ever again in my whole life. Uh, you're right. The Living in the Limelight song. Uh, Charlie, yeah, he's gone. So this is the second of two with Ken Hensley and just uh, just a horrible, horrible album. Massive drop off of the band. At this point. Yeah. Ken was probably kicking himself for uh, this, to joining this band, especially after that one. The first album with him was pretty good, though. We'll, we'll get to oh, that. I love him. Got it high so. <laughs> All right. So my number nine is uh, Southern Native from 2016. You know what? The only reason that this is even rated at nine and not lower is because, you know, if you take the Blackfoot name off of this album, it's actually not bad uh, mm -hmm. as a kind of modern kind of Southern rockish album. You know, think like uh, Blackstone Cherry, Blackberry Smoke, that type of thing. It's pretty heavy in spots. It kind of rocks. Uh, but I, you know, I remember when I got this and I saw this picture, I'm like, what? That, what what yeah what what is the, what is happening here right and then they went on tour right as black could you imagine like if you are someone who did not pick up the cd didn't hear any you know because a lot of people don't follow the news or what's going on with these bands they're just like oh blackfoot's coming to town let me go and you go you pull up at the venue and there's like five cars in the parking lot you're like geez why aren't there more people here and then you go in the band takes the stage and these guys take the stage there's no ricky and you're kind of like what what in the world is happening here right that's kind of like what i think most of people most people who are you know big fans of this band kind of thought when this happened but not a terrible album uh title track take me home whiskey train all good whole hard rockers uh even the, there's a song every man on here which if they would have promoted it correctly probably could have been a crossover hit with like the kind of the modern country crowd right which you know modern country is kind of rocking anyway but, uh, you know, this album kind of died a quick death and I'm not surprised, but it's just really, really puzzling. Uh, this is probably one of the biggest mysteries of the last like decade or so. The yeah. fact that Medlock said, OK, this is what we're going to do here. I don't, I don't and, 
And if I'm if I'm not mistaken, you know, I, I kind of looked this up. I'm not positive about this because who knows in virus times what exists and what doesn't. But apparently, that this band still exists as this fake Blackfoot band, and there's only one guy left in it. Uh, the, the other three guys are different. Apparently, the lead singer is still there, and everybody else is different now. Can you believe that? I mean, <laughs> it's just so weird. I mean, you know, this takes the Molly Hatchet thing to like a totally no another level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Oh, that's ridiculous. And, you know, I, you have to, I, you know, I figured that once Skinner was done with this long drawn out final tour, right, that Ricky would finally say, okay, I'm going to go back to Blackfoot. But it's almost like that's not in, it, it, I, I don't get it. I just don't get it. I don't get it. Wow. Uh, by the way, I wanted to, to uh, a little show and tell. This book is long out of print. Uh, this came out in 2001. This literally is a book of uh, 400 Southern Rock record reviews I did for uh, I did for CG Publishing. We had a Southern Rock sampler in the back, and it, it's funny. This uh, this car originally had a uh, a Confederate flag on there, and the publisher was smart enough to take that off, even all the way back to 2001, right? But, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I wanted to do this book the same for the same reason I want to do those other ones is because all these members were so interchangeable all over the place. And I just wanted to organize everything in a very, you know, organized fashion, like who went where, who was in what bands along the way. So this was kind of a cool thing to do. And I've, I've thought of updating this, but, you know, it just means I have to go listen to dozens and dozens more Southern rock albums. And then as time goes on, it gets a little bit away from sort of the 70s aesthetic of what is a Southern rock band anymore. Like it starts getting, you know, very diluted, right? Yeah, that's a great book. I have mine. I'm, I'm, I can see oh, it right cool. here on the shelf over there. Yeah. Right on, right on. Yeah, yeah. That's what sad is like you mentioned how so many of the members from these bands were interchangeable and yeah. would go in and out of each other's lineups. And now, sadly, like half of them are all gone. I mean, yeah. Oh, it's yeah. Amazing how of, many we've lost yeah, in the Southern rock true, yeah. Crazy. Okay. Yeah. So my number eight, I went with uh, Medicine Man. They're 1990, 1991, I think. Um, basically, Medicine Man is uh, is a version uh, where Ricky essentially does his big hair metal album. Like it's it's a it's a pretty good production. It sounds pretty expensive. It's really really commercial, like those other ones we talked about. But it's actually kind of better. It's it's actually a pretty decent album. I mean, I made a I made a point here in my notes below this album saying this is the break between the good and the bad albums but I, I could almost put medicine man into the good albums it's actually pretty decent um um but but some of it does sound like you know really big budget warrant or aerosmith you know which means it, it does sound pretty capable and professional unlike rick medlock and blackfoot and vertical smiles which just sounds like stumbles right um but no, there's it, it's pretty cool. It's got a couple of nice acoustic things on it. Navarre and Soldier Blue, um, Chill to the Bones, pretty cool at the heavy end of this one. And it's it's super rare. It's really hard to get. I'm not sure I ever even owned a copy of, of this. It's it's I, you know it's probably like a very small label to begin with, and now it's it's basically unexistent out there in the marketplace. So yeah, number eight, Medicine Man. Yeah, uh, yeah, we'll get to that in a second. Um, After the Rain, 1994 is my number eight. Uh, yeah. I kind of lumped this in with Medicine Man. They're both kind of similar albums. In fact, the uh, album covers are very similar as well. Yes, um, it's true. good album. It's, it's probably out of all their records. I think it's probably their mellowest. It's not a very heavy album, but it's got a lot of those kind of southern rock textures. There's a lot of acoustic stuff going on here. It's very rootsy. Um, you got the song Rainbow. It's got good hooks. It's melodic. Uh, the Road's My Middle Name is kind of big and bluesy. Hang Time has a kind of Skinnered feel. It's got lots of slide guitars. The title track is kind of moody, kind of epic sounding. You got a couple covers on here. It's just, it's a pretty solid album. Um, again, it's it moves away from that real kind of com overly commercial and overproduced uh, late 80s stuff. Kind of returns back to the early, early days, though not quite as heavy. I think it's a pretty strong album. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So my number seven uh, is also After the Rain. And uh, I totally agree with you. Um, but to me, it's even it even goes further in that it almost feels like an unplugged album uh, of his. Yeah. Um, 
you know, even even when there is full band stuff going on, it, it's very kind of woodsy and acoustic, almost like, um, you know, just just very sparely uh, recorded. But uh, I think there's a bunch of good songs. And I, I just like Ricky as a personality and as a vocalist and singer and his his phraseology and his bluesiness. Right. So, yeah, I really like Rainbow. Uh, he covers uh, T- Tupelo Honey, uh, T- Tupelo, Tupelo, uh, Van Morrison. Right. Um, but uh, what else is really good here? Nobody Rides for Free is pretty good as a, as a slightly heavier one. Bandolero is acoustic as well. So, so basically, um, yeah, this, this sounds like sort of a, like a down home on the porch, uh, bluesy acoustic album. And it turns out Ricky's pretty well suited to that. So yeah, I, I go so far as to say um, it, it almost seems like a bit of an outlier, like, like, like one of those MTV unplugged albums in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Good album. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, my number seven is going to be Medicine Man from 1990. Uh, I think it's a good back to basics album for them. Still pretty catchy, but uh, pretty heavy in spots. It's funny. You look at Medicine Man and After the Rain and one's kind of like the electric album. One's kind of like the acoustic album, right? Um, good songs on there. The Steelers, great. Uh, Sleazy World, Not Gonna Cry Anymore. Run and run, and I like chill to the bone or chill to dub bone, right? The D A D B O N E, right? Um, good and heavy, and I, Soldier Blue is a terrific song. So I, I wish I can get a copy of this. I remember seeing Medicine Man in in the stores back when it came out, and for whatever reason, I never bought it. And now, all these years later, I'd like to have it. It's like impossible to get. I mean, you you could probably get a CD copy for about nine hundred bucks out there if you're lucky, right? But I think that's a little bit more than I want to spend. <laughs> it's not that good. <laughs> Well, and, 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 you know, as usual, you, you know, just satisfy your curiosity. You could just go on YouTube and look up these songs and just play them all. Yeah. They're all, the whole album is there. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, right? So yeah, it's uh, YouTube, $900, pretty easy choice. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So my number six, I'm going to go with the debut, no reservations. I don't own a copy of this anymore. I used to have it on vinyl. Um, but uh, so 1975, they're on Antilles, which is like a uh, subsidiary of Island. Um, so not, not, a, not a real major label with much uh, distribution, but it's a, it's a good looking record. I mean, it's got a neat album cover on it. Um, but basically, um, right out of the gate, they're actually a, a pretty heavy band, pretty busy. Um, one thing I noticed, uh, Jackson definitely has a style back then where he's kind of throwing everything but the kitchen sink. He's probably still in that semi-ego phase where it's it's a little bit like it's my first record I want to show everybody what I can do kind of thing and he actually writes all the songs on it which is which is pretty amazing there might be one or two co-writes on it but basically it's it's written by um by by Jackson Spires produced by Jimmy Johnson and David Hood at Muscle Shoals um the production's a little bit kind of boxy and cheap sounding but not terrible um it's just a little a little into the mid-range zone missing a little bass missing a little treble um but a good good album and, and heavy and a lot of action on it, a lot of a lot of little action points all over the record. Um, lots uh, lots to dig into on the debut. Yep, I agree. It's, it's a very solid one. All right, my number six. This is the one while I was putting together this list that that did the most movement up and down and all around. Uh, first it was higher, then it was lower, then it came back up again. And finally I said, I got to stop this because uh, at some point you just have to make a decision. Uh, I'm going to go with Siago from 1983 is my number six. I, I like this album a lot. This album works where Vertical Smiles absolutely fails. And uh, it's the first album of two with Ken Hensel, like we talked about earlier. You know, you got Semi and Angel, terrific catchy southern rock anthem lots of Hammond organ I think when this pairing of Blackfoot and Hensley works it works really well and I want to hear more unfortunately I don't think we got enough of that throughout the two albums but uh, Crossfire great song great chorus uh, you know you got the cover of Nazareth's Hearts Grown, Grown Cold which I could have done without here I would have rather have had uh, another original song I didn't really need that but uh, we're going down it's pretty heavy upbeat teenage idol is kind of Blackfoot doing like the 80s pomp rock thing. I dig that. Uh, going in circles, kind of more pomp, pop metal, you know. Uh, White Man's Land, pretty heavy. Sail Away is good. Uh, Driving Fool. It's got Hensley on slide guitars. You got the triple guitar attack. Pretty, pretty neat, right? I just think it's a, it's a good cranking, accessible Southern rock album. And I like this. And I it's just a shame that this was probably their last really, really strong album. And then they would kind of go off the rails. But uh, I like this a lot. And I don't even mind the cover with them on the front, right? I think it kind of works here. They look kind of menacing and serious. And 
album's a lot of fun. Cool. All right. Uh, so my number five now, I'm going to go with the second album, Bomber. <laughs> yeah. Looks like Motorhead Bomber, right? It's kind of yeah. cool. Uh, but it's no, it's called Flying High. Second album, 1976. Um, I don't have much to say about this really, other than it pairs up so well with the debut. I mean, the basic, I like, I mean, I really like Island of Life. I love uh, the, the title track, Flying High. Um, I don't feel it's a great improvement over the first one, which I thought was a really good album anyways. It's very similar. Um, the, uh, Jackson's co-writing everything now with Ricky. Um, you wonder what the politics of that are. All of a sudden we go from Jackson writes every song and oh, Ricky now writes uh, every <laughs> song with Jackson. So you wonder what's going on there, right? Um, but um, but no, it's a, it's a good solid album. Again, there's still, they're still kind of nobody on a pretty small label. Like nobody really knows much about this record, but uh, there's just a lot of great riffing and playing and just, just grinding heavy southern rock on here you know it, it, they almost strike me as you know when bands say um uh i really like acdc so uh but they weren't making enough good music so i just wanted to make more of it because this is what i want to listen to and it's almost like blackfoot saying um leonard skinner isn't heavy enough for me but i love the idea of leonard skinner we're just going to make more of that stuff and and we're going to make the heavy version of it and so yeah this is really good underrated a couple of uh, first albums for Blackfoot. Yeah, and to me, it's almost like those first two albums like almost could have come from the same sessions, right? Yeah, and yeah. They're, they're very Skinnerty but heavier. And yeah. I, yeah, I mean, you took the words right out of my mouth. My number five is No Reservations, the debut. Okay. You know, recorded at the famous Muscle Shoals, right? Doesn't get much better than that. You got Railroad Man, Indian World, both real big and heavy stars is kind of emotional uh born to rock and roll kind of has like these first two albums is like a lot of these kind of like almost like thin lizzie like uh dual guitar twin you know leads going on here and there which is pretty cool take a train you got big wheels uh, i stand alone is the big long piece with the you know guitar solos that go on forever at the finale they're kind of like early free bird or green grass and high tides right before they actually did highway song later on so it's got all of the southern rock cliches but I dig it. I think it's a really fun album. And I think the only thing that really, for me, that separates Flying High and No Reservations from the next couple of albums is, you know, they discovered that big, fat, metallic guitar sound shortly thereafter, which you don't get as much on here. It's not as big a riffy album as the three that are going to come fairly soon after, but lots of guitar playing on the album, I think. I, I enjoy the first two quite a bit. I think they're very good. Yeah, cool. All right. So my number four, I am going with Strikes. 1979 um you know i've i've always um i've always kind of had it in for this album never liked it very much um because i really don't want to hear anybody ever do wishing well ever again i still have bad memories of sabotage doing that as well um so don't like that at all don't want to hear a cover um I've never been a big Highway Song fan. I know that's a massive song of theirs and one of the signature tunes, and they named a well-regarded live album after it that came out in 1982. But to me, it's a little bit too uh, still in love with you or still loving you uh, for me, for my taste. So it's, it's not my favorite version of them doing mellow songs, which kind of comes on the later albums for me. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I've always considered this just a little bit patchy. The bizarre thing about this record is that it went platinum. Um, and I actually had to look that up because I it's almost one of these I couldn't believe. But I went to the RIA a site and looked up gold platinum search. It's really easy to do. It's really kind of interesting to see this because it's got this little pull down for details thing, which I use all the time when writing books because it tells you when something went gold and when it went platinum. So you could look up something like Back in Black and see the whole history of how fast all this is happening, right? Uh, for these big records. So this went um, this went gold. It took a few months. It was in 1980 and some point. And then it went platinum in 86. So basically when Blackfoot, everybody hates Blackfoot by that point, it doesn't even exist. That's when it actually got its platinum uh, certification. And um, what I found really weird to see this go platinum is that nothing else ever certified at all, even at gold. So it's it's odd. And I, and I really don't remember hearing much from this record on the radio very, very, uh, very often. Um, it had um, Highway Song went to number 26 on the charts. Train Train went to number 38. I love Train Train. Um, great, great song. It's, it's by far my favorite on it. But yeah, I've just always had it in for this record a little bit. Produced by Henry Wack, drummer for Brownsville Station. 
Um, ne never, never really uh, liked the songs on it very much uh, because I kept comparing it to later ones, which I, I like way more. Yeah. All right, my number four is Flying High, second album. Okay. You know, I, we, we kind of already said a lot about this one already. I, I think this is a really strong, strong record. Maybe, uh, you know, some tra traditional Southern rock elements coming into play here. You hear a little Skinner, you hear a little Charlie Daniels in spot, a little Marshall Tucker, but, you know, again, more of an edge. Uh, Feeling Good's a great song. Title track is great. Stranger on the Road, I think, to me, hints at what's to come on the albums coming after it. That's like the kind of the first instance of hearing those big riffy guitars. It's like, oh yeah, there's there's that kick-ass Blackfoot that's kind of like right around the corner. Uh, Save Your Time's got some really cool uh, twin guitar leads. Uh, Dancing Man, big, crunchy, and funky. Uh, Island of Life, you mentioned really strong. Junkie's Dream is another good one. Madness. I don't know. I think this is top to bottom, pretty, pretty strong album. And I like the fact that they weren't like at early on, they weren't diving into covers. You would think, you know, sometimes these bands come out of the gate with the first album or two and they're kind of a little light on material, so they throw a couple of covers in. Ironically, these guys did more covers as their career went on, which was kind of strange, but but uh, good album. I, I dig Flying High quite a bit. Cool. All right. So so my number three is um, Marauder. Uh, where's my front cover of Marauder? There we go. Um, my, my top three are very, very close to interchangeable. Um, you know, Marauder, I, I kind of always put it third and I guess I'll leave it third. I'm, I'm not crazy about the um, production on it. It's a little bit rounded off. It reminds me a little bit of the, uh, the Jackal debut to Jackal Push Comes to Shove. Um, it, it has, you know, a few of the same sort of complaints for me, but I love so many of the songs on here. Uh, it had Fly Away, which went to number 42. It had Searchin' that went to number 108. Uh, Good Morning is the super fast, you know, almost thrashy kickoff track. Really, really cool. But it also has those, those uh, you know, down home Southern melodies to it. Rattlesnake Rock and Roller. Yeah, Searching is, is a good kind of mellower one. Fly Away is is such a cool poppy sort of hit. It, it pointed a little bit to the future of what they would do. But still, it had the old old school production values. You know, production on these records is, is listed as Al Nally and Henry Weck. But Al Nally is sort of, if I remember, from all my old interviews i mean he's he's essentially the uh the mover and shaker business guy uh with with ricky they're they're a team like that so he's more like an executive producer i believe um and henry weck is is more the producer you know the brownsville guy but uh yeah dry county too hard to handle is a really cool super heavy one on here diary of a working man so that to me is the version of highway song that i like out of these guys i love diary of a working man and it's so that's your your mournful bluesy southern ballad that i really like um because highway song kind of just uh, annoys me a little bit but uh yeah every time i go back and play this record i'm surprised at at how many of my favorite Blackfoot songs are actually from this album. So it's a, it's a really good one, 1981. More to come on that in a minute. <laughs> my number three is uh, Tom Cat from 1980. Okay. You know, my top three, I always kind of think about and look at almost equally. Uh, it's just a trio of albums that I think is the best stuff this, these guys ever did. Uh, and Tom Cat, there have been times that I might have ranked this a little bit higher. I think my number two and three are pretty much the same. I had a hard time putting them in an order. But uh, again, another really heavy album, you know, kind of you mentioned uh, Marauder, which is probably their heaviest album. This also is another one. You got, uh, you know, Warped starts things off in blazing fashion. Uh, on the Run, Street Fighter. You got uh, that metallic boogie of Gimme, 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 which is a really fun song. Uh, the absolutely grinding and groove laden every man should know queenie in parentheses fun song in fact a song that they play live forever uh you got the twin guitars of reckless abandoner you got this kick-ass cover on there which i always kind of dug you know these three albums in a row with the kind of animals on the front pretty interesting became kind of like and you know the uh the blackfoot look unfortunately they never stuck with a any kind of logo that was the same from album to album but hey whatever but uh yeah tom catton really really great album uh definitely a top shelf black for that cool cool there's another little bit little bit more show and tell for you there's a there's a promo shot of ricky looking all cool and rock and rolly yep and uh i don't know if you remember these these are the southern rock all-stars albums right oh yeah wow so this is when uh i mean this is the only time i met all these well no actually i met them with 
Yeah, I guess it was. I, I think I've seen him twice in Toronto as Blackfoot or maybe just once. But but anyways, um, this was when Jackson, this was 2004 and Jackson died again suddenly from an aneurysm um, uh, in 2005. Um, so this is Jackson, Dave Lubeck from uh, from Molly Hatchet was in this band. And um, there's no picture of him on the on the other one. Uh, Pete Geddes and Jay Johnson. He's another big Southern rock guy. So so they were doing this kind of thing, you know, and this is this is somewhat because of, of just this war that went on between Ricky and the rest of the guys. I mean, these guys had to go out. I mean, these guys were coming to Toronto as black without Ricky. And it was the three of them, right? Three of them and singing. I mean, I was so ticked off because I arrived there and the great Bobby Barth from Axe was the was playing Ricky Medlock essentially in the band. He was the boy band version of Ricky Medlock. And I worshiped those that third and fourth axe album, right? The uh, offering and whatever the next nemesis is the next one, right? And I wish I would have had them to get signed by by Bobby, but it was great just hanging out in the dressing room with those guys and listening to stories. And Bobby was a great guy. And so as an amazing show, I mean they're just they, they that's the other thing about Blackfoot they were known out there they had a reputation for being just one of the most kick-ass live bands they would just they would just mop the floor with headliners over and over again so they were a really cool band so anyways there's a little little side trip for you my number two is Siogo and this is where my contrarian nature comes out obviously you know we've got that YouTube show the contrarians and I could probably do a show on this although I didn't pick it as my number one but I love, love, love the commercial direction of the band in this. I thought they just knocked it out of the park. Um, they're just on fire. Um, you know, Send Me an Angel is just so heavy, yet it's melodic. Um, but the thing to realize on this record, the, the rhythm section is just so biting and heavy. And yet it's, it's modern as well. It's got, it's got a modern production sound. Um, I, I like um, Hearts Grown Cold anyway, so I, I was glad for the one cover. The amazing thing on this is that three or four more of the poppy ones sound almost like they are covers and almost to the suspicious point where it, it seems like I can't remember from my interviews, but it seems like one of those situations where you quietly buy songs from songwriters, but you put your own names on the credits. It, it almost feels like that because there's songs. Basically, there's three or four on here, like Teenage Idol, which you mentioned, Pete, right? Um, and Crossfire um what else maybe going in circles that sound like big song doctor songs um but apparently they wrote them themselves so that's that's fine uh but yeah white man's land super heavy driving fool super heavy um we're going down just crazy heavy metal so um you know i've often uh, mentioned that i thought golden earring is a great example of a band that used the new technology and got great sounds that don't sound dated in the 80s um, and I thought Siogo was like that as well. I've always loved this album and always trumpeted this as a, as a somewhat contrarian point of view as just a really, really great album. Ken Hensley's a great, you know, addition. He's, he's playing Hammond kind of all over it. Um, so yeah, the poppy songs, the heavy ones, I, I love basically everything on it. I just, I just love the whole concept and direction of it, even though they drastically changed their sound on this. It's not very Southern rock. But uh, yeah, I just I just think it's a really strong album. So it's an interesting point you bring up about the how the songwriting seems to have changed a lot on this album and how, you know, you, you can almost say, well, are these really their songs? Right. So I, I, as you were talking, I started to think, well, you know, they've got Hensley in the band now. So I, I couldn't remember how many of the songs he co-wrote. And then I'm, I'm looking right now. So he, he co-wrote Send Me an Angel. Okay. He co-wrote Run for Cover, Sail Away. And I think that's it. So just three of them. Okay. Yeah. It could Because, you know, when you think about it, it's not like these are catchy, kind of like old Uriah Heap, because the old Uriah Heap stuff wasn't like this either. But some of Hensley's solo albums are kind of like this a little bit. But obviously... Well, this they... is also like Abominog too, right? I mean, it's a little bit like Blackfoot's Abominog. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So I don't know, but yeah, it's, it's almost like uh, they really matured as songwriters all of a sudden at this point, yeah. but then they kind of forgot about it after, with, the, with the next album, right? Which is kind of strange. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. All right. My number two is going to be strikes from 79. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, you know what, Th this is one of those instances where, yeah, there are a couple of question marks on here, 
but I think the songs that I really dig, I dig a lot. And that's kind of elevated this album for me, but you know, I could change this up with Tomcat and just about any day. Uh, you know, I kind of dig highway star. I mean, highway star highway song. Yeah. I dig highway star also. Um, but, uh, I agree that I think Diary of a Working Man is actually the better of their two kind of long kind of epics, so to speak. Uh, Road Fever, I absolutely love. Another one of those great kick off the album tracks, I think, you know, between Warped and Good Morning and Road Fever. It doesn't get much better than that to start off an album, right, with these real barn burners. Yeah. Uh, again, a lot of covers on this album. I think their cover of uh, I Got a Line on You by Spirit actually works pretty well. You know, would I have rather had another original? Absolutely. Uh, Left Turn on a, on a Red Light is a great song. You know, I agree with them wishing well. They do it okay. But man, everybody was doing this song right around this time. And quite frankly, for me, I think the, the best cover version of that song was done by Gary Moore. All the other ones I could probably, you know, do away with. Uh, and Train Train absolutely kills. Really, really great song. Good kind of grinding southern boogie right but uh and i love the cover obviously it's pretty cool snake production i kind of dig on here and uh yeah i put it but today it's my number two you ask me next week it could be my number three but i know it's it's definitely always going to be in the top top echelon of blackfoot albums yeah you know and i got a line on you i that's the other one i forgot which i hate i hate that song i just i just hate that melody of that of that chorus it's it's a funny thing. I remember talking to Greg Rowley once of uh, he's in Journey, right? I mean, at the time it was a solo album, right? But this idea of um, and Santana. So we were talking about this idea of there's melodies that you hear in Santana that are kind of like depressing in 60s to me. And I don't know quite how to describe it. Um, you know, are they minor key things? But but I hear that and I got a line on you and uh, give me some love and, and and these songs that that they just depress me instantly when I hear them. So that's that's the other I, I don't want to hear black with doing covers at all. But if they are going to do them, do something really cool. Right. So, yeah. And, you know, most of their covers are like they're OK, but I would have rather heard their own songs. Right. That's yeah, the and, and no improvement over the, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, but anyway. OK, so my number one, let's pull this out of here is uh is tom catton uh love this record always have again it's another henry weck production 1980 um again it, it's almost uh it's almost suspicious to me if strikes goes platinum it, it's almost like there was some fight with atco which isn't generally considered a very good record label to be on anyways but it almost seems like there's some fight with atco that they didn't count these, they didn't want to acknowledge that it was a, it was probably a gold record. They didn't want to pay the band to be a, you know, gold record. Like I hear that story all the time with certain bands, right? Um, that that things don't get certified because um, the label's kind of hiding how many record, how many copies they sold. I'm not saying that's the case, but it just it just strikes me that that I, I feel like this is sold over five hundred thousand copies. I don't know. Um, it was in every record shop back in the day. They were yeah. advertising it in all the magazines. That one and Marauder. So I don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and, you know, they, they were out, you know, kicking ass live. So, so yeah, Love Warped on here, On the Run, Street Fighter, Gimme, Gimme, Gimme is like a great kind of barroom party rock and boogie thing. They didn't actually do a lot of that, oddly. Um, they, they, did, they did a lot of sort of um, really heavy stuff, uh, the mellow stuff, and then, and then you know, a, a, a few sort of different... Um, variations on a hard rock theme but they didn't do kind of like straight barroom boogie rock all that often which is kind of interesting right every man should know queenie is really cool again with that stupid parentheses on it right <laughs> um but my favorite blackfoot song of all time is on here and that's fox chase i just love the whole shorty medlock harmonica uh, intro that he does on train train so those two songs are kind of a pair right they go together uh, but Fox Chase, when that kicks in with that riff and, and the way the drums come in and everything, it's just so groovy, right? It's just like, and it modulates the way like ZZ Top kind of is known to do that. It's got a modulation part in it. Um, but yeah, Shorty Medlock, again, from my old interviews, which go back a long time. I haven't talked to Ricky for ages, right? But um, Shorty's like either, it, it, it's like, is, is he Ricky's uncle? Is he his grandfather? We don't really know, right? Or, or I, I think I've heard both answers on that. But Shorty Medlock is just this legendary old legend uh, from from down there, and he plays harmonic and he and he sings with this this really heavy southern accent and and does this this just priceless intro to Fox Chase. So uh, 
so yeah, there you go. That's my uh, that's my number one. But uh, literally, my number one, my number two, and three are very pretty pretty interchangeable. Siogo, Marauder, and, and Tom Caddy. It's a great one. It's a great one. Good choice. My number one was has always been my number one. Uh, love this album, Marauder. This is you know nearly a heavy metal album, right? We, we talk about Blackfoot kind of getting pretty close there. That's they they're pretty much arrived here. Uh, for years, back in like you know, the late 80s and into the first half of the 90s, like whenever me and the buddies would be getting together and, uh, you know, we'd go to a party and we'd all or whatever, go out drinking somewhere and we crash at one of our places. Right. You know, I'd always be the first one because I'm a morning guy. I'd always be the first one to get up in the morning and got to see a body sleeping all over the apartment. And I would go and I grab this and I put that first song on. Good morning. Wake up, motherfuckers. Right. You know, that that was kind of like the, uh, the the morning wake up Reveille thing. Right. And, in, 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 uh, you know, back in the day. So uh, but yeah, great kick ass song. Uh, too hot to handle. Just absolutely smokes. Uh, Fly Away, like you mentioned, is great. Dry County is so heavy. Uh, Fire of the Dragon. I mean, oh, man, so good. So crushing. Uh, Diary of a Working Man is good because I like the kind of rootsy first half of it. And then you get those heavy riffs that kick in at the end. Ricky just snarling away. Uh, did the production on this album. I think Ricky is just singing up a storm right about this time. And, and you know, I, we mentioned it earlier. I don't think he gets enough credit for the, his vocals. And I think he's a, actually an excellent, excellent singer. Uh, paying for it is great. Um, yeah, the whole album is just, you got the melodic searching good stuff. I still love this album to this day. And, uh, to me, this is like the pinnacle of uh, Blackfoot, but you, know, you got a handful of albums here that are really, really strong. Um, that for someone who's never listened to Blackfoot before, I think, uh, any of our top three or four or five, you know, yeah. quite frankly, I, I would say the first album all the way through Siago, those are the ones you need to listen to. Yeah, for sure. It's funny. Good morning. Yeah, that's that's such a classic story because, you know, I mean, it is about it says there's there's no shame in having yourself a good morning. That's part of the lyric. Right. And then and then the first part is is like like the Southern Rock Party guy trying to get up. And then next it's the young young exec. He hits the deck and he needs his little wake up pill. Right. Yeah. So to get going and or yeah, no, no, he crashes later. Right. After going to work, he's dressed to the nines and all this stuff. And then. And then at one point, Ricky said, get up, get up, right in it, right? So it's, <laughs> yeah, it's funny. And it's just a great explosive heavy song. It's oh like, my God, yeah. It's like a sister song to Warped, essentially, right? Yeah, exactly, all right? It's, I mean, they, they just, on those three albums, they kick off each album with these great, just yeah. big bursting tunes, you know? I mean, God, you put put the needle on the record or you pop that scene, it's like, dun, 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 dun. It's like, holy cow, you know, what's going on here, right? Uh, great stuff. Great stuff. Yeah, I dig this band. This uh, It's kind of a shame what's going on. You know, you mentioned before how for a spell, the, uh, you know, Ricky was off in, in uh, Skinner, obviously, and the rest of the guys were touring under the name Blackfoot. And I think now that I think about it, I think the last two times that Blackfoot has been here, like have toured and played here in my in neck of the woods in New York, right. neither time was Ricky Medlock in the band. Wow. And both times you had these completely, you know, you had the the rest of the guys doing the Blackfoot thing. Then you had whatever you want to call what's happening now coming. So I could just imagine like you going to see Blackfoot and you're not really kind of keeping up with the news and you're like, OK, someone's missing here. Right. And to see that twice in a row, you know, in between like what, 10, 20 years. Very strange. Very but, strange. you know, having having Greg, Charlie and Jackson there and then the great Bobby Barth as as the lead singer and front man is pretty cool because Bobby's got a great, you know, an, enough pedigree and history behind him. And then as you dig into these songs, you realize that Jackson was a huge part of the songwriting. So it's not like you're missing Phil Linet in the band or anything. Like right, that. right. You're getting you're getting a pretty good connection. So that that was really that was a really good band. They, they were just so per professional and so, you know, the sound was great. Everything was great about them. Yeah. And Martin, Martin mentioned before the uh, the Highway Song Live live album, which is pretty kick ass. Another one of those live albums that should have been a double. Right. Yeah, exactly. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. But definitely a good one. So if you want to experience kind of what we've been talking about, how ferocious a live band they were, go check out that live album. They've got a King Biscuit live album, too. I believe. That's right. Yep. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So there you have it, everybody. Uh, ranking the albums of Blackfoot. Uh, curious to see how you guys rank them. Uh, rank them as you like them. Remember, there's no right or wrong answer. We all hear these uh, albums differently. So uh, I want to thank Martin for jumping on with us once again. Uh, he and I will be coming back in uh, just a few short days. I think we're doing Pantera next, right? 
Ah, oh, could do. Let's discuss. Yeah, sure. Let's have, have one of our. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> this is on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. Martin, you got anything you want to plug? Anything coming up on YouTube, podcast, uh, books? Any other stuff? Um, well, let's see. The last uh, the last episode of the podcast, first we had the, uh, you know, the shocking death of Eddie Van Halen. So I did that as an emergency episode. Then the one that goes up today uh, is uh, Smarty Pants Metal. And then uh, because we've uh, kind of discussed this uh, on and off, um, I'm going to do the next episode. I'm going to do uh, basically the five heaviest uh, uh, U.S. albums of the 70s. So, so basically, what were the five most heavy metal albums coming from America in the 70s? So, so the, you know, it's, it's called History in Five Songs with Martin Popoff. So it's going to be the five songs representing what I, what I figure is the five heaviest songs uh, that came out of America. Cool. I'm hoping you put Ram Jam on that. I, I will. Yeah, it's it's funny. One, one last note to put about that. So I, I went and looked in the back of my old reviews book, the uh, Collector's Guide to Heavy Metal, the first volume, the 70s. There were four. They're all out of print. I think I've got some 90s left. But I, I put a list in the back. I put four lists in the back. But one of them was the heaviest albums of the 70s. Right. And I think there's 13 albums from not from America, all from the UK. And I think there's one Australian one in there, Let There Be Rock, before you even get to the first American album. So that's why it's gonna be kind of an interesting episode because basically most of, most of the heaviest albums of the 70s, right? Heavy Load might've been in there too with full tilt at high speed or whatever it's called, full speed at high level. So that's 1979, but, but basically, um, yeah, mo most, of the, most of the heavy albums from that decade were, uh, were from the UK. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that, though, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just the way it worked. So, all right, everybody, that's a wrap. So, uh, for Martin Popoff, I am Pete Parter. We'll see you guys real soon. Take care.